What you're seeing at the bottom of this simulation is essentially a histogram of the various particle speeds, with white and yellow particles moving faster and blue particles moving more slowly. And this gives you a sense of the number of particles with each speed or with each color in the actual simulation. One of the remarkable things about this distribution is that it has this shape regardless of how we start things out. Say, for example, I start out the simulation with only one moving molecule. Watch what happens. We're going to start it off with a single molecule in motion. Let me actually stop this so that we can see what this looks like. One moving molecule, and that's this white molecule right here. Watch what happens to the distribution as we allow that molecule to move and collide with all the various particles. We can see this distribution, or this histogram, changing shape. And over time, as we allow things to essentially equilibrate, look, we're back to this same sort of hump shape where we have very few, essentially no molecules not moving at all, very few molecules moving very slowly, there's some maximum speed, and there's kind of a long tail of molecules moving relatively quick. In fact, this distribution will be achieved at equilibrium regardless of how we start out the particles moving, and this is one of the amazing insights of 19th century physicists concerning the ideal gas. And in honor of one of the discoverers of this idea, this distribution of speeds, which is the equilibrium distribution of speeds in an ideal gas, is known as the Maxwell distribution. That distribution of speeds has a corresponding energy distribution, which is called the Boltzmann distribution, but primarily will focus on the speed distributions of the particles in the form of the Maxwell distribution. So a Maxwell distribution graph is going to look like this. And it's important to understand what we're looking at here. I mentioned the term histogram. If you understand what a histogram is, you will know exactly what you're looking at here. Just keep in mind it's a kind of continuous histogram when it's drawn in this form. Rather than having bars, we have a frequency or a number of molecules for each possible speed. So on the x-axis, we have all the possible speeds that the gas molecules could have, all the way from zero to, in theory, infinite, although this will tail off and the uh, number of molecules with very, very high speeds will reach zero at some point in any practical sample. On the y-axis, we have number of molecules, and this is a measure of the likelihood of each speed, essentially. In the full sample of gas molecules, the most likely speed is right here at u sub p, at the top of the distribution. And at each speed, we can get a sense of how likely that speed is to be observed by the height of the bar. For example, we see no molecules with zero speed. No molecules are stationary. That's one of the tenets of the kinetic molecular theory. This particular graph is the distribution of molecular speeds in a sample of molecular oxygen at 300 Kelvin. And what we're interested in is understanding how this distribution changes as we make changes to the molar mass of the gas, changing its atomic or molecular weight, as well as the temperature. We'll begin to investigate that in the remainder of this video. And we'll begin to investigate that in the remainder of this video. Now, a few key quantities that are related to the Maxwell and Boltzmann distributions. First, the root mean squares, or RMS speed. This is a kind of measure of the average speed of gas particles. It is not the average value, which we could get by, for example, integrating over the distribution. It is the square root of the average of the squared speed. So the square root of u squared bar, the average of the squared speeds, where that average is the sum of all the speeds squared divided by the number of particles, and the number of speeds here does factor in the number of molecules with each particular speed. Now in general, and the, this figure shows us this in graphical form, but it's also true mathematically and can be proven mathematically, the root mean square average speed is going to be higher than the maximally likely speed u sub p, or the most probable speed u sub p. So it's not quite the average, it's not quite the modal speed, it is the root mean square speed. And the utility of this will become clear actually very shortly. The average kinetic energy is one half times the mass times the root mean square speed squared. And that's why the root mean square speed is useful, of course, right? Because the root mean square speed squared times the molar mass of the gas times one half is a measure of the average kinetic energy. And the remarkable thing for an ideal gas is that this is equal to a value that depends only on temperature. One way to think about this is this is a definition 
of T, of the absolute temperature scale. The average kinetic energy is equal to 3 halves times R times T. And if you calculate out the units, you will see that this comes out to an energy per mole, as does this value. So average kinetic energy, energy per mole, 3 halves R times T. 3 halves R being a constant shows that the average kinetic energy is directly proportional to the temperature of the gas. We can use these two expressions here in the middle and on the right to develop an expression that relates temperature and root mean square speed. And that's done here on the next slide. 3RT is the molar mass times the root mean square speed squared. We re rearrange things to isolate the temperature. The temperature is equal to this expression, where really the only thing that's not constant is the root mean square speed, and we can flip things around, take a square root, to see that the root mean square speed is equal to the square root of 3r divided by m, that's just a constant, times t. So the root mean square speed is proportional to the square root of the temperature. And unsurprisingly, the intuitive conceptual idea here is that at higher temperature, the particles are moving faster on average. The root mean square speed increases. That's going to push this distribution out to the right, kind of flatten things out. And it is important to appreciate that this is only on average. There will still be particles moving fairly slowly, even at high temperatures, just by the very nature of the ideal gas model. But most of the particles are moving faster at higher temperatures. Let's see what this looks like on a simulation of the ideal gas. I'm going to turn the heater on and watch this distribution closely. The distribution rescales as it spreads out, and so you'll see it sort of pop back up periodically, but you can see the spreading of speeds that occurs, the spreading of the distribution that takes place as we heat the sample. So notice this is kind of broadening out and it's blipping up every time the distribution spreads out by some critical amount, but we are getting more molecules moving faster as the heater does its thing. Let me speed up the simulation to make this a little more dramatic. So you can see things sort of flatten out as the heater increases the temperature of the gas. We're getting more yellow, more white particles inside this container as the temperature increases. This figure shows several Maxwell distributions overlaid on top of one another for a given gas at various temperatures, starting at a relatively low temperature of 100 K. We have a relatively compact distribution with most of the molecules moving at relatively slow speeds, all the way up to 1000 K, where we have most of the molecules moving at much faster speeds. So you can see the distribution flattening out, and the root mean square, average, and most probable speeds are all moving further out to the right. So here in going from the relatively cold 100 K to the relatively hot 1000 K, we have more particles at a higher speed, a greater root mean square speed, and all that good stuff. So temperature is going to cause this sort of broadening out and shifting to the right of the Maxwell distribution. This really is just a graphical depiction of the idea that there are more molecules moving more quickly at higher temperatures. This graph shows a different situation. Here, we're looking at a constant temperature at the Maxwell distributions of five different gases with different molar masses. And this shows that the speed distribution does depend on mass at constant temperature because temperature relates to kinetic energy, one half mv squared. And so changing the m will change the v's. Changing the masses will change the speeds of the particles at constant temperature. And so we're going from xenon, which is relatively heavy, to helium, which is relatively light, with these intermediate gases sort of in between. And the thing to notice here is that the xenon atoms are moving much more slowly overall than the helium atoms are, and making the gas lighter tends to shift this distribution out to the right at constant temperature. We have more particles moving at higher speeds in the lighter helium sample than in the heavier xenon sample. And this, of course, assumes equal numbers of moles and all that good stuff. So we can see that mass also has an impact on the distribution of speeds, with lighter particles tending to move faster, considering two gases at the same temperature. To end this discussion of the kinetic molecular theory and the Maxwell distribution, I want to talk about Graham's law and return to the idea of effusion. Remember, this was the idea of gas particles escaping through a tiny hole. Effusion rate is directly proportional to the root mean square speed of the gas. The faster the gas particles are moving, the faster the effusion rate. And we can prove 
using expressions we developed previously, that effusion rate is proportional to 1 over the square root of the molar mass. So let me roll back up here to where we showed that the root mean square speed was equal to the square root of a constant, 3r divided by m, times the temperature. Let's say we're at constant temperature, and we're considering variations in molar mass, the root mean square speed is then directly proportional to the square root of 1 over the molar mass of the gas. And that's essentially exactly what Graham's law says. Since effusion rate is proportional to the root mean square speed, effusion rate is proportional to 1 over the square root of the molar mass. So that connection between root mean square speed and molar mass and temperature turned out to be useful, and the utility is in understanding where Graham's law and relative rates of effusion come from.